in the design computation group, and I have the pleasure to be introducing this evening this evening's event. Um, this is the third and last talk of the fall 2015 design and computation lecture series in the MIT Department of Architecture, co-organized by Theodora Barduli, fourth-year PhD candidate in our group, and Professor Terry Knight. Themed computational mediations, this lecture series probes new modalities of action, agency and expression emerging from the confluence of human intentionality with the properties of computational technologies. Collectively, this semester, three speakers address questions such as how does computation inform process of design and making? What is the role of design and designers in instituting new kinds of human technology relationships? And can mediation itself become a locus of design? <coughs> we are delighted to welcome our third speaker for the series, Lauren McCarthy. Lauren McCarthy is an artist and programmer based in Brooklyn, New York. She is full-time faculty at NYU ITP and recently a resident at CMU Studio for Creative Inquiry and IBIM. She holds a Master of Fine Arts from UCLA and a Bachelor of Science uh, in computer science and art and design from here at MIT. Her work explores the structures and systems of social interactions, identity and self-representation, and the potential for technology to, to mediate, manipulate, and involve these interactions. Lauren's work has been widely published in various venues. She has worked on installations for the London Eye, North Carolina Museum, Metropolitan Museum of Art, among other venues, and her artwork has been shown in a variety of contexts, including the Arts Electronica Center, Complex Festival, Seagraph, and Wired Store, among others. So please uh, welcome with me Lauren McCarthy, whose artistic and pedagogical contributions provide uh, provocative insights to questions of interaction, mediation, and sociality. to uh, augment my abilities socially with some technology. 
And I used this very like DIY aesthetic because I wanted to make this suggestion that you know anyone could build these things. We could all think about the things that we don't do well and, and maybe make some tool to fix ourselves. And for me, the, the questions I was thinking about is like what is normal, what is good or better, and, and how do we decide that as a society or community? Um, and that around the same time, I was reading a lot of Urban Goffman, uh, who was a sociologist uh, that wrote a lot in the 60s and 70s about um, interaction viewed through the lens of uh, performance or theater. So the, this idea that uh, you have a certain presentation that you make on stage and then everyone has their kind of backstage. But even more interesting to me was this idea that we all have these roles that we perform, and when we meet someone, we try to like size up what their role is. Or who they are, and so you start out with some rough approximation, like you know, she's kind of like my friend Jen. She's a, a doctor, like my dad Bruce, and uh, he's very funny, like my friend uh, Jack. And then, as you get to know the person, you realize, well, this person's not anything like Jen or Bruce or Jack. They're actually their own person. But I had to make kind of like a rough approximation just to have an idea of how to interact with you. So I think these things are useful. Um, but the question for me is, at what point do we start kind of projecting our expectation of the role you're supposed to fill onto someone else and like not let them have the space to be themselves? Um, I was also thinking about Harold Garfinkel, who's another sociologist who did these breaching experiments, where basically he would uh, do these small little tests, like for example, he'd tell his students to go home and act as if they were guests in their parents' home. And so the students would go home, they would just be like extra polite, and they would put in dishes in the dishwasher. And this would upset the parents very much um, because it was breaking the social contract, right? They weren't being rude, they were actually being much more polite than normal, but they were breaking this kind of unspoken relationship or this pattern of behavior. Um, and so when I think about this, it reminds me of uh, this idea of, from software to like a glitch, right? It's a small error that uh, in a program that kind of propagates as it plays out. And then you see, uh, through this propagation, you begin to understand something about the underlying system, the way the whole uh, system is composed. And in some cases, it can be very beautiful also. So this is Takashi Murata's um, monster movie. So this is an example of like a video glitch, video flashing. Um, and so my thought was, you know, what happens when you do this in social space? Can you introduce a small little glitch and see it propagate into something more interesting. Um, so the, the wearables were all about uh, what I thought I did wrong. So I wanted to see what other people's feedback was. And so this was a table where you could rank how much you were enjoying the conversation by pushing a pedal from positive to negative under the table. And then the tabletop would glow or dim as an advocate of all of the participants. And if it got too low, it would flash a distress signal for someone to come and try to save the conversation. Um, and so when I, I presented this, uh, people were not very into it, surprisingly. Um, they said, you know, I don't want this in my living room. I don't want people to be giving me feedback on what I say and do and telling me whether they like it or um, whether they uh, want to hear more or not. Uh, unless we're in a virtual space, I guess, and then it's, it's actually fine to just tell people exactly what you um, so I thought that kind of just taking one from, thing from a virtual realm to the physical suddenly seemed totally out of place and that was kind of interesting to me. Um, so a lot of this work is really inspired by critical kind of design and probably a lot of these references would be familiar to some of you. But for example, Dunn and Raby's placebo project uh, really got me thinking. So the idea being that they would take these kind of use, these objects that didn't actually do anything but were supposed to help you navigate your relationship to electromagnetic space or electromagnetic waves. Um, and they would give them to people and have the people would use them in their homes. And even though the people knew that they didn't do anything at all really, having it in their homes for a period of time, they started to develop relationships with the individuals around them. And I thought that this was really interesting. You know, you just give someone a piece of technology, even a technology that doesn't actually do anything, and you start to depend on it or use it or form a relationship with it. Uh, and this one on the right is the sexual obsessive compulsive disorder machine. Uh, the idea being that if you're uh, 
addicted to porn, you can hold on to this thing and watch. And as long as you don't get aroused, you can watch it freely, but then if you uh, start to get turned on, it will pixelate the image. And so you have to kind of learn to watch the pornography without getting turned on by it. Um, but another one of my favorites by Noam Torin, this is the Accessories for Lonely Men. Uh, so, a uh, chest hair twirler, a heavy breather, a uh, plate thrower, a uh, sheet sealer, cold feet, and a hair smothering in the face for the bed. Um, and of course, Krzysztof Rodzinsko's uh, Court of Roll, and a lot of his work deals with uh, people that you know have stories to tell and don't necessarily feel like they can tell them, and creating objects to facilitate that in some way. So I think he, in this case, is dealing with very extreme stories, but we all have these sort of stories that we do or don't tell. Um, and this is just a device that I really wish I had, which is Kelly Dobson's screen body. Um, the idea being that if you if you feel like you have a screen, um, you just scream into this bag and it isolates the sound and captures it for you. So then when you're in a more appropriate place, um, to more hypothetical, but the thing that is exciting about, to me is when you can actually use something, because it takes it from this just thinking about it to this, you know, how are you going to use this object? Um, and and I, so I kind of take some of these ideas and move over to the performance space. Uh, so with this project script, I wanted to see, okay, the table was like still too, too much um, obfuscation of the feedback. I just wanted people to tell me directly what to do. So I, I did this one month performance where anyone could uh, log onto this website and each day I'd post a script for the following day. And anyone could log on and edit that script. So they could write lines for me, stage directions, costumes, they could write themselves into it, they could change things other people had written. And at midnight the script would close and it would become my uh, mandatory performance for the following day. And so I did this repeatedly for one month. The thing that I found was that at first it felt really constricting to have people telling me what to do all the time. Um, I, it kind of felt like this hell that like I could kind of trap myself in and couldn't get out of. Um, but then there was also this moment where I realized that the hell was not the piece. The hell was the small box that I put myself in normally, where I think that the small little gesture outside of that box feels uncomfortable and weird. And by being forced to do some of these things that I would think uh, that's not something I'd say, or that's not something I'd do. It made me realize that there's so much more space out there, there's so much more freedom to be had. Um, and so, performance art is another big inspiration for me. Taishin um, Shea's uh, one-year performance where he was attached by a rope to his collaborator, Linda Montano, for one year. Um, so they couldn't touch each other, but they had to remain attached the entire time. And I think, uh, Performance art is really informative also when you're thinking about design, when you're thinking about like interaction design. Because some of these gestures are so simple, right? It's just a piece of rope, but to imagine that experience over a year, it, it's kind of unfathomable how it would change your perspective. Um, similarly, this is Valley expert Tami Tosquino, uh, where she was reflecting on the media and kind of the distance that it provides us to something that is actually very physical and very intimate. And so she made her own theater where you could, she went out in public and you could reach through the curtains and feel the peep show underneath, which were, was her favorite chest. Um, and again, it's, it's such a simple intervention or such a simple interaction, um, but there's just so much emotion in this image and there's so much um, tension in the whole idea. And also that guy in the background is just very creepy. Um, so that really moves me. And then, Things like Marino Rockwich's Rhythm Zero, where she's on a table with these objects that people can use in any way they want on her. Um, so there's uh, some simple ones like a flashlight or a piece of cotton, but then there's things like a knife or a gun or some rope. Um, and the, the thing that really strikes me about this is it was performed in a gallery, um, and there were you know, a number of people in the room, and some of them did nothing, and some of them 
did a lot of things and it escalated quite out of control. But even the people that did nothing, that was still a choice, right? To be there, to not take an action. And I think this is even more relevant when we're talking about today, when we can see all these conversations happening online or um, in public space. And it just reminds me that even the decision to just witness and not do anything is still a decision, it's still an action. Um, or Adrian Piper's uh, calling card project, where she's handing out these cards saying, yes, I'm black, this is how, uh, I'm here, this is how you can interact with me, or I'm a woman, I'm not here to be picked up. And I think this is interesting because it's such a, a direct uh, conveying of her thoughts, right? So many times we kind of tiptoe around things, but what happens when you just break through the unspoken rule that you can't just say what you do is, or how you want to be? Um, and then lastly, I, uh, Sophie calls the detective, where she was followed around, she hired a private investigator to follow her for uh, a, a day, or a few days, where she was just walking around Paris. And as the detective, or the private investigator, is taking pictures, not knowing that she was the one that hired him, she is, in response, taking her own notes, as if she's being kind of, like, followed or pursued by a lover that she So all of these are like ideas that I'm kind of meditating on, and then they, I'm wondering how does this translate, you know, thinking about the technology, thinking about the world that we live in today. Um, and so, going back to the script piece and that feeling of freedom, I wanted to see if I could make something that uh, had the, that same feeling of kind of freeing or opening space, but could I let other people feel it as well besides just me? Um, so this was a, an app that I made. Me, Jessica, I so totally love you. I just, I can't, I just can't be your girlfriend anymore. I can't. It's not anything you did, you're perfect. You're perfect. I just need some space. I just need some space. <sighs> Um, on the online space, 
there's the, the um, Tango by Brian House that lets you browse the web with someone else. So while it's a browser extension, so while you're surfing, uh, your partner is all, can also be at home on the web. And as you move from page to page, you kind of pull your partner along, or when they move to a different page, they drag you along too. Um, just kind of showing the, the different relationships we might have through a network. Um, or a uh, news tweet by Julian Oliver and Dr. Vasilia uh, was a, a device that you plug into a cafe and it reroutes all the internet traffic in the cafe through this device. And then what it allows you to do is uh, you can kind of like man in the middle tweak the information. So if someone's looking at the New York Times, for example, you have the opportunity to modify the text before it gets to the person that's looking at the page. Um, so I think that the, these projects like this illustrate that these networks that we're using are changing. They're, they're hackable. They're unclear. And, and they're changing the ways that we can relate to each other um, and our relationships with each other. And so I was thinking a lot about these, um, all of this when I did this project uh, that I'll show you next. I was also, I mean, I had all these ideas, but mostly I just wanted to figure out how to get a date. Um, and how to do that successfully. So I thought I would uh, apply some of these network ideas to my, my dating life um, using a service called Amazon Retail Culture. Um, so this video kind of explains it. Actually, I guess I should give a little bit of um, background. So if you're not familiar with the service, the Candle Turk, the idea is that it's a website you can uh, go on run by Amazon, where you can post a small job for someone to do, like translate this text or tag this image, a job that a human can do really easily, but a computer can't do so easily. And you pay the person some small amount of money, like 10 cents to translate the sentence or tag this image. So I thought, so this is the system that I was using on these dates. and then 
like sometimes the server would crash and I'd have to like run to the bathroom and SSH and like, <laughs> try to fix the code and like come out and be like, I just put on some lipstick. Hey. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, it would be very hard for someone else to try this, but I wanted other people to have the experience and not just think about me doing it. And so I worked with uh, uh, some friends in the Netherlands in a studio called Perceptor uh, to make it an app that anyone could use. Um, and so the idea is that it wasn't just for dates, it could be for any situation, and you could invite, uh, you could hire mechanical with tariff workers, but you could also invite Facebook friends, either like specific friends or all of them, um, or just request volunteers to assist you. And you could give them kind of a brief of what you're trying to do. Um, and there are some mechanisms, mechanisms for giving feedback on the device as well. Um, so this was like a page where you could actually go and browse into any open session and help out random strangers yourself. Um, and this was the trailer we paid for. Deal with 
their ex-wife. Um, these are real sessions, and um, I would listen into some of them. It's kind of crazy. Um, and then when I we watched it, it uh, we did this in conjunction with um, Rhizome in New York, and we sent a couple couples uh, or hopeful couples out on blind dates, to, and each person used the app. And the idea was that uh, it was streamed through the Rhizome page, and then all their Members could log on and try to help these two people on Valentine's Day actually uh, make it work. And so one of the people that gave uh, was my friend Tim Joy. And so he actually wrote up some observations and made some drawings about his experience. And I just wanted to share a few bits of that. Um, so these are just some excerpts. We were talking fast about different topics. My app is running well, and I get some good feedback. We talk about code and painting. It feels like this might almost work out. After we finish our second drink, I feel pretty comfortable with her. But our conversation does feel a bit hyper-stimulated. There's not much time between our conversation. There's no space for natural pause. It is easy to confuse stimulation with excitement. She turns off her app and we ask her to check. There are a few moments of strange silence. But finally, a genuine sense of presence between two strangers. The withdrawal from Crowdpilot is really disorienting. I know there are at least a few hundred people listening, but I am already feeling displaced from my date, who is physically close. So fast and so easily, our presence disappears from one another. Technology has made us more connected than ever. Shouldn't it help us get more from each other? She just won't stop talking about her pregnancy and what yoga moves that the whole class should not do because she... Us Plus gives suggestions based on speech analysis and facial expressions. It's just everything. Everything is... Uh, how are you doing, Mom? Well, actually, things haven't been all that great. I wasn't sure whether to tell you this, but, um... More honesty. More balance. I feel like we're really communicating, and sometimes it's just... It's just not the same. Uh, I try to talk to you and you don't respond, and I can't even... <laughs> I love you. It's been so long since you said that. More connection. It's looking pretty bleak. And her profit margins fell last quarter. But I think we can turn things around. If we outsource step four, we should be okay. We could also get it down five cents more if we use cheaper materials in steps 19 and 23, and the public will never know. I like how you think. <laughs> more productivity, more success. Get more out of your conversations. Us plus. Um, so that's a real app. If it looked appealing to you, you can actually use it in your Google Hangout. Um, and it's, there have been some similar projects. So this is 
uh, a browser extension by Joanne McNeil, and she was pointing out that when you write an email, it's usually not acceptable to just say, you know, send me the thing, or like, see you at two. You have to say, hey, how are you? How's it going? Can't wait to see you. And she also noticed that this is much more expected of women than men. And she was kind of annoyed about this. So she made an extension where you just write the message, and then you hit this button, and it adds in all the extra emotional data for you. Um, and so this was kind of an in art intervention. Uh, and then probably like a month later, there was this company called Crystal Knows that would basically do that for you. Uh, but this is a real startup, so it would look through your LinkedIn profile and all your friends and then tell you exactly how to um, talk to each person. But not quite the odd magic of the one click. Um, and yes, we all erupted in fury over Facebook's experiment on users last year, yeah, um, because they were experimenting with the news feed and found that if, um, if you saw more positive posts in your feed, then you would feel happier, and if you saw more negative, you would feel uh, less happy, slightly, but statistically significant. And so everybody freaked out about the ethics of this, and uh, I have less interest in the ethics, or less comment on that, but what I thought was interesting is no one was really talking about the, the outcome. Of this, I mean, what what are the implications here? And so I said, why should Zuckerman get to decide? Take back control, um, leverage Facebook's own research, and manipulate your mood on your terms. So it was an extension that you could add to your Facebook profile, and you could decide how positive or negative you want to feel, or emotional, or aggressive. And by sliding sliders, it would turn to your news feed for you. And according to Facebook's own research, it should should work. Um, and so the the question here, I guess, is you know, if you could have an interface for your emotions, which apparently you can, um, what would you do with it? How would you use it? And is it wrong to turn down your friend's depressing feelings when you just really don't have a good day? Or is it wrong to want to be happy and use technology to augment your ability to do that? And is uh, positive or negative the best binary? Or are our emotions a little bit more complicated than that? And how do we deal with this when we're designing systems? study said that uh, based on your Twitter feed, some uh, researchers can actually predict a couple months in advance when you're going to break up or when your relationship is going to end. And so my question is, would you want this? I mean, in some sense, it would be useful because you could like stock up on ice cream and you know be prepared for that moment, right? Um, and so this question of do you want it is the, the thing that keeps coming back to me. What, Maybe it seems a little bit terrifying, but what if it works? And how do you navigate that? And um, the references that I'm not showing, but that are also super inspiring to me, is the sort of work that's happening in a lot of the groups that we lab, like um, the effective computing or robotic life groups, that are actually looking at ways that technology can improve our social relationships. And so um, this next piece is kind of an exploration of some of those ideas in this like modified self. We only have so much emotional bandwidth to bring it in limited time. What's the fun? That's the fun? Our social circles are widening. All those relationships just can be overwhelming. Now, there's an app. People Keeper tracks your physical and emotional response while you're hanging out and analyzes the data to identify who stresses you out makes you excited, sad, or happy. See how your relationships stack up and let PeopleKeeper find the ones that work for you. It'll automatically manage your relationships so you don't have to. Scheduling time with people that make you feel good and blocking the ones that don't. Forget fake friends, failed romance, and FOMO. Optimize your social life with PeopleKeeper. Based on 
HIV, actually, the, the analysis um, of your kind of emotional level. So it pairs with any off-the-shelf heart rate monitor. Um, and then this was some of the kind of pseudocode you're experimenting with. Like, what should be to do if you're calm or angry? Um, and, and then, so we made the app. This, I say, we, uh, this was a collaboration with Kyle McDonald. And we um, tested it out with a group of students at Carnegie Mellon University. So these were nine undergrads. And uh, it was kind of perfect because I think they are at a place where they don't have so many preconceived notions about what technology should or shouldn't do for them, and they really went into it with an open mind. Um, and so we, we gave it to them for a week. They were using a version that affected their Facebook, so they could friend people. It would automatically friend people or ask people to hang out or message them or post on their walls, because um, this was the kind of form they used the most. Um, and they tried it out. So I just wanted to share some of the reactions from some of the students. My name is Miles Payton, and I'm a student and teenager. I'm hoping it'll be informative more than anything. Gonna kind of remind me, like, hey, you should pay attention to how you're feeling around this person. Using the app as a justification for not wanting to spend time with someone um, is a lot more definitive than like just saying, like, I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> Very informative and sort of what I was doing and how um, my interactions with, with people were either negatively or positively affecting my day. Well, like the process of going on Facebook and then like finding or like stalking someone on Facebook and then like suddenly seeing like a post that you didn't expect to be there by yourself is sort of funny because it's, you know, challenging your like authorship and like agency in that situation. What well, made me angry is the most thing that stood out the most, I think. It's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't hang out with Mark. Maybe he's kind of a dick, huh? <laughs> um, and we also did a workshop, we've done a few workshops, so this was one in Dublin where we gave people a guidebook that would accompany their experience with the app for a week. And um, these were the participants. And so the guidebook just had some extra kind of activities asking them to reflect each day on their relationships or to try new ones. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to point out, the, um, I don't know if you know the Black Mirror episode, that it's really related with that. I don't know what comes before or... Yeah, the, oh, you did? Oh, so, it, yes. because I saw it like, directly related. Yeah, no, I think that's a, um, a great show and I really like it. I think they're approaching it from a different angle, right? Which is to take you there cinematically. And so, uh, I'm interested in the one where you're just kind of like stuck there yourself. Hi, um, 
I just have questions about how you would tell a computer what to say because well, social interactions and what's expected to be saying in every situation and in every different community within every different culture is different. And saying something might be really normal here, but it might be really absurd somewhere else. And also, can you quantify all these complex cultural codings and situations and emotions? And how would you propose to do that? I, I just wonder how you come to conclude what to um, what to tell a computer to say to you. And at an instant of, if the computer says what to say to you, you don't have enough time to uh, reflect on what computer tells you. And it, there is also a bit of, for me, it seems that there's a vendor that you just get to believe what computer tells you to do. And after, let's, let's say, a conversation has ended, you might feel that it wasn't you who were talking to. I just wonder if you thought about it. Well, yeah, so the first question about the cultural thing um, is a really good point. And so most of these things are super American and super um, summing up like my specific experience. So see what that economically or as a woman or you know in this country. And they're very different in other places. And like for example, when we did this um, workshop in Dublin with people came back and I liked the app, except it was just like way too blunt. Like I would never tell someone like, you stressed me out. Are you kidding? And so we realized like, well, yeah, well, I guess we would do that here probably. Um, and so there, there are these cultural differences. And there, it's also unexpected. So like um, the Crowdpilot app, one of my friends told me that um, in India, he heard some of his friends were using it because they would go on these uh, blind dates with their potential person they're going to marry. And they'd have like one date and went well, then the families would set it up, so like arranged marriage. And um, the, his friends, who were female, said like, it was too much pressure, because they would go on the date, and they were just like so nervous about making a good impression, and there was so much stimulus that they didn't have time to, you know, they would finish, and they would say, I don't know, or I had all these questions they didn't ask him. And so they were using the Crowdpilot app to um, have their friends come on the date with their potential husband, um, and the friends would be like, ask him what he thinks about Ask him what he thinks about that, and then give way in at the end, like, yeah, I'll marry him, or don't, don't marry him. Um, so it's kind of interesting and weird how these things function in other contexts, but I think if I were to make something for another culture, it would involve spending a lot of time there and like, understanding that space much better. Um, my question is my question. I think it was about, oh, listening to a computer. Um, yeah, so hopefully this came through. The idea here is that. All these projects, they're not 100% like, yes, this is the thing I want to say in the world, but they're not 100% like, you know, critical. Um, or like, I don't want to see this. And so I'm trying to hit this space that's in the middle. And so the point is to make me feel sort of uncomfortable with this. Like, if, if the computer is telling me what to do, how do I know if it's right or not, or is that okay? And um, it, it's more of a question. Hi, Lauren. Um, thank you very much for an amazing lecture. Um, I'm not sure how to frame this, so I'm going to try to do my best. Um, you've shown all these projects that are extremely well designed, highly polished products that hit the streets and that affected real people and the real social interactions. And uh, you you tag them as experiments, as things that you were trying, like new interactions, new social ways of people relating to each other. Um, and you've kind of, I have the sense that while you were explaining them, you've tried to avoid evaluating them or taking a critical standpoint on the results of those. And actually, like the fact that you refer to them as art pieces rather than things that you evaluate only seems almost like you're trying to detach yourself from the fact that there are results and there's evaluations to be drawn from those things and like conclusions that you or other people working with you may draw from these experiments. Um, I wonder if after all these years of experimenting with other social, um, other people and their social interactions, if you have any conclusions, like big statements or big
happy. Um, uh, I don't know, like conclusions of things that you have drawn as like um, things that you've learned from all these things. I mean, if you were, for example, if you were Sherry Turkle, you would be saying like, oh, technology is making us feel more alone, right? But like, what do you say about all these things that you've uh, done? Sherry Turkle's a bit, bumps me out a little bit sometimes, but um, I think that I'm the kind of person that you perhaps watch one of these things and you think like, oh, this one thing makes me feel kind of tense, or I raises a question in me, huh? Um, for me, I feel like I always feel tense about all of these things, and there are questions that are like constantly running through my mind, just all the time. And it, it, this is what makes it hard for me to interact with people. And so I'm trying to give you a taste of <laughs> what it's like, or what I feel. And so that's in that way it's less of an attachment and more of like a, a body of my feelings, even if it is without uh, judgment. Maybe that's it's less about you know, I'm not I'm not trying to avoid making a statement or a conclusion, but more like I'm tr trying to avoid judgment, perhaps, and let you make that for yourself. Um, but the the thing that I realize and probably you just realize this by like being a person in the world for more time, um, is just that everyone is really different and that everyone is coming from somewhere totally different. And so many times we look at the way someone responds to something and we think like, what a jerk, I would never say that, or whatever. Um, but it's not you, it's someone else, and they have like a totally different experience and a totally different context. And so um, I think that's the thing that I'm realizing. <laughs> Just like you can't judge the technologies I've made to let people um, have their own judgments, I don't feel like I can judge people Thank you, that was really, really interesting. I was just curious how you explore some of these ideas um, through your teaching. Um, and what happens there? Yeah, so I teach, uh, I teach one class uh, called Social Hacking at CP. Um, actually, in collaboration with Colin Zahn, who I mentioned a few times, um, we work together a lot. And it's a class that's a lot about all of these things, but also like the students kind of take it in their own um, directions. And the, the point, I guess, is we try to give them prompts to create glitches um, in different uh, areas or different parts of daily life and see what emerges. But we always try to make the assignments kind of like impossible or possibly confusing. So, like for example, we do one unit on surveillance, and the assignment is to um, surveil someone with the intent of improving the relationship with them. So, like stalk someone to relationship better and you know, figure out what that would mean using the technologies or whatever you want. Um, so yeah, I guess the, the teaching is very related, but it's also, this is just, you know, this is my personal angle on it, but there are so many different perspectives and that's what I really like about the class is like, I'm thinking about all these issues in one particular context. You could look at the same issues but have such a different perspective based on where you're coming. Thanks for your lecture. Um, I'm wondering if you have a stance on what it means to attribute monetary value to certain like questions or like control over emotional things. Like, how does that impact uh, things in your opinion? Um, just generally, or do you have a specific question? Yeah, like for example, at one point it was like for one ninety nine. Uh, get an answer to this question. So is that, are you critiquing that, or is that, what is the, yeah. the intention? Um, well, the intention with the 199 there was to do like the app cost, um, what it would cost to like hire a you know, to respond completely. And so the 199 would get you about like five responses over half an hour. More generally, uh, I think most of these projects haven't dealt so much with money. The thing that I've been really interested in lately, though, is like all these kind of human on demand, um, like TaskRabbit, Uber, and things like that. Um, 
questions with um, the Campbell Turk. But I think the thing that really stands out for me is that when there's like an interface between people, it suddenly becomes so much easier to forget that there's a person. And so you're like, oh, what's the lowest I can pay a turf worker and get them to dance or something? Whereas if you're like negotiating with your neighbor to cut the grass, you're like, not like, oh, what's the lowest I can pay you to get my grass cut? You're trying to like give them a reasonable um, amount of money and have a reasonable relationship with I think that's some of the danger of these apps where you click on a button to hire a cleaner and then you track their location as they come through space to your house and you hit five, you know, however many stars at the end. Um, and I, I think it's a question I do it more and more as we build these systems. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. I, you mentioned some like um, performance studies theories or sociology or psychology and at least the ones you talked about were done in the 60s and 70s, and I was just wondering if, as your research has continued, if you, you looked at like more recent developments between performance theories and psychology. Like the first thing I thought of was Augusto Boal, who's dated, but like is literally crowdsourcing stage scenarios, and was doing that you know way back when. And there's been a lot of group therapy and stuff like that. So is there is there like a a relationship that you've tried to establish between like analog versions of these or like live versions of social training or interaction or, or um, conditioning that like then goes back into the software or have you been drawing from those older sources? Uh, how does that work for you as your research yeah. continues? I think most of the ones I showed are kind of like the starting points or sometimes like the ones that best illustrate the point because so much has evolved since then that this is the easiest one to start with in some context. Um, but I think some of the more recent research is really interesting. And a lot of times what will happen is, like, I took a lot of um, psychology classes when I was in grad school, and I was like almost wanting to switch over to doing that. Um, but, I'll, so a lot of times I'll be talking to uh, sociologists or psychologists and we'll have a conversation about something like cost of plus. And then uh, sometimes it's like, we, I see some work that they've done later, and it's like we both kind of take the idea in our own direction. Um, sometimes we collaborate, so actually on the Crowd Pilot app, I was working with um, some researchers at Intel that were actually like psycho clinical psychologists, um, and they had, you know, they were interested in using it in terms of like therapy, so, um, so like a remote therapist or something. Uh, and so there's always this back and forth, and I like to stay on the art side of things because I'm not trying to propose that this is solution or answer or musical experiment to them. Um, it's more like a provocation. Uh, but I really like to have that conversation um, to feel like that. I mean, that is what I'm just kind of responding to as much as my own daily experience. Other questions?
it's really interesting to me. It's, and it's a really hard question because we would like to think that we have agency and we're not just being controlled by computers. And also, like, what if there's a glitch and if something goes terribly wrong? Um, but then also, what if it does relax you? Um, so I'm not necessarily like opposed to that idea, but I would hope that, I guess I would hope that with these systems that automate more things for us, that we also get out of it something else that feels human. So like more freedom to express myself creatively. Or if it's a person watching you, I hope it's done in a way where you actually feel some connection to that person that you're helping rather than just being like a button, like feeling like a button or a robot on the other end. There's also a, a Google startup that uh, synchronizes music with action for the target video game development. But there's no reason we couldn't do that in real time. So it's sort of watching your life and providing a soundtrack that's synchronized. <laughs> yeah. It's like that movie Her where he said, play a sad song, or play a melancholy song. And I'm just like, why does he have to say what kind of song? Should we just, you know? I have one question before we go to some questions. Um, have you thought of putting like levels of privacy or like filters <clears throat> in this app? So, how would it be possible that I, I want people to give me feedback on this type of topics, but not in others, or like when the conversation becomes really intimate, I have this filter that says block like people from right. listening to what I say, or have you thought of them? Uh, well, I mean, with the Crowdpilot app, which is probably like the most designed thing I've done, there, of course, you could like tell them what sort of feedback you wanted, and there's also a mechanism like if someone's giving you unhelpful Thanks for your presentation. Um, so something that kind of is illustrated in this to me, which is really fascinating, is this tension about who we really are and our suspicion um, of computers or of a crowdsourced group giving us you know, suggestions about how we should behave as a way to kind of, I guess, confront our identity and sort of like, I'm, maybe I'm not really being myself because this group is telling me what I should be and how I should behave. And yet, from what I observe in our unmediated human interactions with people, like, it's all about hiding who you really are, right? It's like we desire to like tap into truth about each other, but at the same time, like we're trying to hide and be on the surface so that we can all agree about something. So I'm wondering, I mean, that's an observation, but I'm wondering if you feel like you've had any additional insight into that or think about like opportunities to maybe remove the barriers through the crowdsourcing or something like that. having to cut each other off, but 
making more spaces where people feel freer to express themselves. Hello. Um, so I'm curious, in I think your first project, um, it looked like your work was displayed in some sort of gallery setting. And obviously with that group, you don't have a gallery. And it's just um, on the internet, so anybody can use it. Um, so I'm curious what your attitude is towards um, the space of the gallery as a means of displaying art, whether it's physical or virtual, if it's something to think about. Yeah, I think um, I generally have a desire to do things outside the gallery. I feel sometimes that when you go and look at something in that context or in a museum, you're like, OK, I'm having a cultural enrichment experience right now, and then you're like, oh, that's weird, and you put it in your, you know, cultural segment of your mind and walk away, whereas if you encounter something you don't know that it's art necessarily, and maybe it catches you in your everyday life, um, that maybe there's potential there to affect you a little bit more, or to make you rethink your everyday actions rather than just your philosophical theories about something. Um, but I think there is something nice about a gallery also, which is that, uh, you know, some of these reactions on Twitter to Crowdpilot, it's like, people say yes or no or whatever, and they, they didn't even actually, like even the Fox News segment, it wasn't even clear when you watch the whole thing if they actually knew what the app did. They had like a 20 minute discussion, I don't think they had seen the app. Um, and so, the thing that is nice about the gallery is that it gives people a chance to actually like, spend a few seconds, you know, like, oh, people only look for like 20 seconds. What a shame. But yeah, but that's so much more than like 0.2 seconds of line. Right? Um, okay, we'll, we'll take this last question. Have you tried any of this with people older than 35 or 40? <laughs> um, sometimes. And it just seems like everybody, you have one generation is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I said, I mean, it's very. Um, Based on my, I'm trying to express what I feel, and so that's why a lot of it is like sure. my, you know, particular zone of life. Um, I think there's like mixed reactions. It depends on the particular app. So in general, I find that older people are more skeptical, or like I don't need a computer to tell me what, what's wrong with you kids today. Um, <laughs> whereas the kids are like. Yes, I need a computer to tell that person I don't like them. Um, but I don't, I hesitate to say that because they're, it's not quite so divided like that. Yeah, I just wondered if those people now, when they are 35 or 40, right. will keep that same attitude or whether yeah. it's going to, if it'll be become 35 or 40, they'll just, be, when they're 50, they'll just be like the people are 50 years old today. I, I totally wonder that too. Um, <laughs> But I, I mean, I see my friends already being like, look at these kids, you know, having sex and being so terrible and it's actually, well, like, the students in college right now actually, like, are more altruistic and donate more to charity and have safer sex. And um, so I think there's always a tendency to think, like, the younger people are screwing it all up or doing it all wrong. Um, but I think there is something different that, like, older generations, the technology might change once in your lifetime, whereas with up, with younger generations, you're used to things turning over so fast, it's like, you know, you don't even know how to use your phone community here because it changes so much. So maybe there's a difference that you're used to this perpetual change or more comfortable with it. But okay. okay, and we should wrap up. So thanks again so much for the lecture. Thank you.